Jennifer and Carol and, and Ruby and all the needs, Lord. I just lift them up to you, Lord. I just lay them at your feet, Jesus. And I just pray that where there needs to be a healing touch, there'll be a healing touch. Where there needs to be wisdom and guidance and direction for the doctors, I ask for that, Lord. If it's a medication, whatever it may be, or a, or a diagnosis, Lord, what and I think Lori as well, Lord, just lift her up too and help them to figure out what's going on. And Lord, ultimately, we love you. We thank you. We know you're in control. We just put our trust in you in all these areas. And Father, I thank you that for each individual person here tonight, I just pray that you'll bless this time we have together, Lord. And I humbly come before you again, ask for a fresh anointing upon myself, that I can teach us in such a way to please you and honor you. In your mighty name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So if I get a little scratchy throat, I apologize. I'm, I mean, I don't think I'm contagious now because I, they're like, well, great, you better not be. But because um, I got it a few days ago, now I just kind of got the scratchy throat and a little bit of a runny nose, but I, I feel better today. Um, Lord willing, I think we'll get done with Galatians tonight. We're in chapter 6. And like I said, when we get done with Galatians, then I'm going to go into 1 Peter uh, and then into 2 Peter. We made it through the first five we made it through five verses last week, but if you remember right, we had the trivia and we did a lot of fun things. So we didn't have quite as much time to spend on the Bible study, which was fine. But we're going to start in verse 6 tonight. But I just want to quickly refresh because I know some people weren't here last week. This chapter is kind of a pivotal <coughs> chapter. It kind of shifts gears from all the other chapters in the book of Galatians. Um, he goes from... First five chapters, he's basically been spending the whole time talking about what old covenant versus new covenant, the covenant of grace versus being under the law, faith versus works, and, and all these things. Well, in this chapter, he, he kind of gets away from that, and what he starts focusing on is okay, if you are under the covenant of grace, and we know under the covenant of grace, you get saved through the promise of God. Okay? The promise of accepting His Son, Jesus Christ. Then you get born again and the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you, right? Now in this chapter, He starts shifting gears and talking about what a Christian should live like, look like, under the new covenant of grace that has the Holy Spirit living in them. And if you remember, at the very first part of this, He talked about that we are called to come along fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord when they've been caught in a sin. Didn't say judge, didn't say reprimand, it says gently come and help restore that person. He says, those of you who are spiritual. Well, if you're born again, are you spiritual? Of course you are. Have the Holy Spirit living with you. And I think that's the reason he used that term, those of you who are spiritual. In other words, you don't come to restore that person to your flesh, you allow the Holy Spirit living in you to minister to that person. Gently come alongside that person. Help that sin that they're in. And remember that word caught, if you look it up in the Greek, which I did, it doesn't, it's not talking about living in a habitual lifestyle of sin. It's talking about a believer that falls into sin. But it's not living there all the time. Come and help restore that person. Get them out of that, that area. Uh, another thing it said, it talked about, as a born-again believer, spirit-filled person, that we are called to what? Carry, help carry feather, fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, help carry their burdens. So what does that mean? That means when a fellow brother or sister in the Lord are having difficulties in something, you come alongside and you help them. Yes. And the interesting thing is, he said, when you do these things, he says, you fulfill the law of Christ. And we looked at last week, what was the law of Christ? Love one another, he called his love. Yeah. Right? The famous verse, Jesus tells his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. If you do this, all men will know you're my disciples. Yes. Love like that. Love with the love of God, the, the, the agape love that the Lord has placed mm -hmm. in your heart mm -hmm. through the presence of the Holy Spirit. He says, if you do these things, you fulfill that law, the law of Christ. To love. <coughs> well, it's not a coincidence that he says you fulfill the law of Christ. Because remember what the debate that was going on here. It was covenant of grace versus what? The law. Mm -hmm. And he's telling these legalists, legalists 
that if you want to fulfill a law, fulfill this law. Fulfill the law of Christ through the presence of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant. Don't try to fulfill the old Mosaic law. Fulfill this law. So he talked about that. And I think that kind of gets us caught up. Well, there was one more thing. He talked about carrying each other's load or burden. And then he turns around and says, but you should carry your own load. And we thought, well, well, so which is it? Are we to help each other's burdens or well, both? Both. When a fellow brother or sister in the Lord is having trouble, you help them. But you are also called to what? When it says carry your own load, live a certain way. And we talked about that's all going to come to pass at the what? Judgment seat of what? Christ. Christ. And I hope you guys really got that clear because there's there's many Christians that really get confused about the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. They're two completely different things. Great white throne judgment is only for non-believers and that's an issue of heaven and hell. But the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. Has nothing to do with heaven and hell. Has everything to do with what you earned in the body after you were saved. It has to do with rewards and loss. Because we can't earn our salvation. That's a gift through the promise of God by accepting Jesus Christ. So that's what he was talking about when he said we should carry your own load. And I think I guess this caught up tonight. Is there any questions or comments before I start tonight? No? Okay. Then he goes on. We talk about carrying this load. Carry your own load. But help each other carry burdens. Help fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord when they get caught up in a sin. And then he goes on in verse 6. He says, anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. So what's that talking about? Who's the instructor? Am I my instructor? Yeah, it's talking about pastors. Talk about teachers. And what he's saying, just like you help fellow brothers and sisters of the Lord mm -hmm. carry their burden, you know, it can be a monetary thing. That's part of what it's talking about. But it's also talking about encouragement, respect, mm -hmm. helping the leader carry uh, fellowship, partnership. You know, you guys don't have a clue how much it means to a pastor to get positive feedback. To help with that burden that he has. Because mm -hmm. we get up there every Sunday or here every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And we do our very best. And we, we're praying and we're hoping that we're touching and encouraging the hearts of people. And this is what it's saying. You're supposed to share all good things with this instructor. Well, what are some of the good things? If you got blessed, let him know. Mm -hmm. If you think it's a good sermon, let him know. No. If you don't think it's a good sermon, don't lie. But if you think it's a good <laughs> sermon, let him know. If you got blessed by that sermon, let him know. Encourage him. When I was over at my old church, every single Sunday, I'd go up and talk to the pastor and try to encourage him and lift him up. Because I know what it's like up there. And it, 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 it just kind of drains you sometimes because you put so much into it. This is what it's talking about. Share the good things with your instructor. Mm -hmm. Just like you share with the other members of the body of Christ. And it also, of course, can be talking about monetary things. It talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. It says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? In other words, he said, what that means is, the oxen should be able to eat. He's doing the work, he should be able to eat. But he says, is that really talking about oxen? He says, surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of, what's that say? Sharing in the harvest. In other words, if they're doing the work and they're doing these things, they ought to be able to expect to get something back from it. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, let's talk about pastors, teachers, preachers, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? So yeah, it can be, <coughs> excuse me, a material thing, a monetary thing, but, <coughs> oh, here we go. But more importantly, I believe it's this 
encouraging and come alongside and fellowship with them and doing these things. <coughs> I have a coffee fit, I can tell. <coughs> Do you need a cough drop? I got a... You got a cinnamon. Yeah, I got a cinnamon. I might have to switch here in a minute. It's like the more I talk. Okay. So, verse 7. He goes on to say, so he's talking about this sharing with instructors, sharing with others, helping carry each other's burdens. He goes on to say, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So in other words, if you have the money and you can, share it. If you got talents and time, share it. Not trying to earn anything, but motivated by what? The love of Christ that's in you, directed by the Holy Spirit. That's what this whole section is about. It's about the Holy Spirit within you, that these things should start happening in your life. You, and I know you guys have had this happen. Have you ever felt compelled to come alongside and bless a fellow brother or sister in the Lord? And you don't quite understand where that comes from. That's that Holy Spirit living in you. And he says, a man reaps what he sows. Well, it goes on to say, gives more direction by this reaping what he sows. It says in verse 8, the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So, if you say you're a believer, and you're continually, now this is the difference between what it said, come alongside a fellow brother and Lord and help restore them when they're caught in sin. This is the difference. If you are continually reaping in your sinful nature, what is the warning there? You'll reap destruction. Mm -hmm. What's the destruction it's talking about? Christians don't like hearing this, but guys, you still, we are called to live a certain way. And there is warnings all over in the Bible that says if we don't, you could end up in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. There's many verses that say idolaters, all these things. It goes through this list. He says those who live like that, doesn't say might not, it says will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. That's not about believers. Now once again, there's a difference between falling in sin, falling in temptation, having a good heart about it, repenting, turning to God, then doing what this is saying, and you're so in the end to please your sinful nature all the time in a habitual lifestyle with no repentance. But he says, if you so to please the Spirit, the interesting thing there says, what is the eternal life? Who's it come from? From the Spirit will reap eternal life. <laughs> Who's the one that does the work in your sanctity? I think Bruce taught on this. He spent three weeks talk, uh, talk, uh, teaching on this, I believe. He taught about sanctification. Mm -hmm. Who does the sanctification in your life? It's God, right? Mm -hmm. But it's through the presence of what? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's that born again. He says, if you so continually to please the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, from the Spirit, because of the word the Spirit does in your life, you will reap eternal life. You ever heard, I'm sure you guys have heard this story. I, I thought this was a, I didn't come up with it, but I've, I've heard other pastors use this and I always like this analogy. When a person gets saved, there's two dogs living in you. There's the sinful bad dog, right? And then there's the good moral dog that wants to live for God. Whichever one you feed the most mm -hmm. is going to take over. Yeah. That's just the way it works. If you continually are filling your eyes with things that you shouldn't and doing these things, it's going to start getting to the point that it's speeding your sinful nature. See? But if you continually listen to the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, then you've got a promise right here from God that the Spirit will reap eternal life for you. Mm -hmm. Amen? It talks about this as well in uh, 2 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. It says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 
So let me ask you a question. If you want more and more of God's blessings in your life, according to that verse I just read, what do you got to do more? You want to sow more and more and more. Some Christians miss this. You know who God really, really wants to bless? There's people that want to sow. Mm -hmm. People that want to help. Yes. People that want to do things for other people. That's who God continuously blesses. Because you got to understand, yeah, He blesses us, but He blesses us and overfills, overflows us so we can bless others. So you want more in your life? You want to be blessed more in your life? You need to start sowing, not sparingly, but generously. Because it says, we'll also reap generously. Now some people take that out of context and they say, okay, that means if I sow generously, I'm going to start getting all this monetary things and material things. It can be, but so many times it's talking about spiritual blessings. Talk about a closer walk with yes. God. It's talking about feeling more of His presence. I would say 99% of the time, that's the blessing you receive. So that each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That gets back to the thing that we talked about in the Word of God, if you really dissect it, it's not even enough to do a good thing. Mm -hmm. you got to do a good thing for the right reason. What's your heart? What's your motive? And God is able to make all grace abound to you. Now the prerequisite of this is the verse before us is those who <coughs> sow sparingly. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all, does this say some? All things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's why he does it. So you can abound in these good works. This is this sowing that it talked about the verse before, that God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, whether spiritual or your sinful nature, that's the things that's going to start coming out. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, now who's that? God, right? He's the one that supplies the seed so we can sow. He's the one that gives us the blessings. He's the one that gives us money when we have money. He's the one that gives us our talents, our abilities. So it says, now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food, food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Mm -hmm. What's the prerequisite to that? If you sow sparingly. Mm -hmm. So many Christians miss that. You know, I've talked to Christians, well, why? I just don't understand why won't, God won't bless me and this and that. Well, you can't expect God to bless you if you got the ten finger clench all the time. Mm -hmm. You never want to help anybody and you never want to get involved. You never want to bless anybody. It's all about you. No. What did all these verses say? He does this to the people who sow mm -hmm. generously. So you can even do more for others. Amen? Mm -hmm. You will be made rich in every way. But once again, what was the prerequisite? Those who mm -hmm. sow generously. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in the thanksgiving to God. So that's a huge blessing. That brings thanksgiving to God. You know, if you do it right, you have the right heart about it, and you come alongside people, help them carry the burdens, help them when they're having trouble with sin. Sometimes it might be financial. Sometimes it might just be, Lonnie, like when I was all laid up with my heart, you come over and help me fix my toilet. That's what that's talking about. That's that right there. It just You don't ma imagine how much it blesses that person. And it brings glory to God. I'm like, man, thank you that this person has that heart, see. And he's saying, okay, legalists, you want to follow all these laws, this is the law you need to start fulfilling. You've got to sow a certain way. You've got to show the love of Christ. Fulfill these things. Live the way God has called you to live. Amen? That's the new covenant of grace. Once again, a little different than we were talking about last week. Don't get confused. 
New Testament, Old Testament. We're talking about New Covenant, mm -hmm. Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tony. Yeah. Maybe some of you are in this situation. There was a lady and her husband was a big time preacher, and they called him all over the country to speak. You know, and he and she was left at home, so she studied the scripture. You know, and it, it went on for years. You know, and so she's always home and. And you know, he was a big time preacher and she made all these studies. Well, well, how come the Lord, you know? And then the Lord called her to be a lady speaker. Mm -hmm. And so then the Lord called her to go around. Well, all those years she's been studying, she already studied ahead. She didn't have time. Right. And so then the Lord blessed her, you know. Right. So we may think, well, God hasn't done anything for me. He's preparing you. Yeah, and you know what exactly fits into what Pastor Max talking about is this very next verse, verse 9. It says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time. When's the proper time? When God decides. Mm -hmm. When that harvest is going to come to pass. You will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Just like his example there. She did all this studying and then when God was ready to have her do it, then she started reaping the harvest and started teaching. You know, a lot of times, I think this is especially true when we share our faith and we want people to get saved right then, right? Well, we just sow, right? God's the one that makes it grow. God, you know, just because we don't see it right away doesn't mean it's not going to happen. There are going to be people that we've been praying for for and witnessing to that only might not even get saved till after we die and go to heaven. But we never know when that is. And that's when he says, at the proper time, mm -hmm. if you sow generously, it will reap a harvest. Mm -hmm. We just sometimes don't see it. Amen. Yeah, also, I witnessed to this man <clears throat> by giving his heart to Christ two times. Nothing happened. Well, then the next thing I, I knew that he got saved. His sister went and witnessed to him, and he got saved. He probably wasn't ready the first two times. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and sometimes, you know, you might share your faith or do something, you kind of lay the groundworks, and somebody else will come along, and they'll hear it. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul talked about. Yeah. You know, he says, I laid the foundation as an expert builder, but not always are you the one that's going to reap the harvest that you did. It could be somebody else. But in the big scheme of things, does that matter? No. Because it's for God and the people of God. Amen. So verse 10, he goes on to say, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Does that exclude non-believers? No. No. We're called to do good to non-believers too, but it's supposed to be even different for because it says especially to those who belong to the family of believers. In verse 11, it says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. What, what, do, you, what do you guys suppose this is about? Why Paul said that? You understand almost every letter that Paul wrote, he dictated it. Um, he'd have a secretary that would write it. Because they believed that because of his vision was getting so bad, and he'd been beaten so many times, he couldn't hardly write, and he couldn't hardly see. Matter of fact, some people think Luke helped him pen a lot of his letters, and Luke was a personal physician that come along with him and help take care of him when he was out ministering to people. But the reason he wants you to let, so from here, verse 11 till the end of the chapter is gonna be in his own writing because he's letting them know how important it is, and he wants to make a point to them goes on in verse 12 and says, so this is still in his writing, his handwriting. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So this is what? This was the legalists that were coming in. These were the people that saying, accepting Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior is fine, but that's not enough. You got, if you're a male, you've got to get circumcised. You've got to follow the Mosaic laws. 
He said, they're just doing this for outward impression because it says they don't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Because think about it. They're coming out of Judaism. They're coming out of legalism. If they, if they stood up and said, Jesus Christ is enough, you don't have to do any of that other stuff, they would get persecuted mm. by people in Judaism and by the legalists. And they, and they didn't want that. They wanted to... It wasn't about a heart of wanting people to come to God. It was about not wanting to be persecuted and wanting to, in their flesh, in their pride come in and do these things to people. Verse 13, he goes on to say, not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. So we're saying even the ones that are circumcised, the ones that are under the law, they don't, they don't obey the law. They don't obey the whole law. Let me ask you this. If it was possible to obey the whole law perfectly, did Jesus Christ need to come? No. But God knew that was impossible. And that's why the Savior came. Because, it's how many times have you heard me say this? It's a perfect holy law and we can't keep a perfect holy law. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, they're trying to drag you back into this bondage, into this legalism, and saying you've got to be circumcised, you've got to follow these mosaic laws, and they don't even obey it. They're just doing about it so they can boast about, hey, I got so-and-so, got circumcised, and now they're going to follow these laws plus Christ. See? Any of you know or have come from, I want to be careful when I say this because I don't want to, I'm not going to name any names, but circles that are legalistic, because there's churches out there like that. They're very, very legalistic. That mm. you got to say certain prayers at a certain time. Mm. You got to you got to do the order of the service in exact right way. Mm. And if you do something wrong, there's got to be a certain prayer. I mean, all these things. Now, that in itself is fine. But if you're trusting in that to get to heaven instead of Jesus Christ, then that's what that's legalism. That's ritualistic. That's what these guys were doing. They're saying, Jesus isn't enough, so you've got to follow these laws as well. Mm. And so we've got to be careful because even in religious circles nowadays, you, people can fall into that trap. Tony? Yes? I want to share, it made me think of Dad. Years ago, <coughs> he um, had more than missionaries come to the house. And... Um, so he had him, he invited him in, they were telling him all about, you know, what they believed, and dad looks at the one, well both of them were there, and he said, are you telling me you actually, <coughs> oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> that, that you actually believe this? And um, so they continued to talk and left, and a year or two later, dad was working at the mill and he called the house, dad wasn't there. And he wanted to talk to dad and he said, I want him to know the impact he had on me, I've left the church. And he wanted Mac to know the things that he talked to him about that he told him. This was a couple years later. He said, I've left the church and I wanted him to know. Those who so generously. Yeah. See, that's what he's talking about. Right yeah. mm -hmm. Amen. That's cool. Well, there, there are those who follow dietary laws. Yeah. Uh, you know, cleansing laws. Right. All there, kinds and, of there stuff are, there. and there are people who follow Jewish dietary laws still today. If you want to do that, that will, if you want to do that stuff under the Lord, because you love God and you want to do that, and you want to be faithful to God and do some of that stuff, that's fine. But if you're doing that because you're trying to earn your way to heaven, mm -hmm. that's not no. good. That's what this is. It's legalism. you got to trust in the work of the cross, period. Nothing else. It's about Jesus, not about us. We can't earn it. We're not good enough for it. Then he says something precious in verse 14. I'm going to go ahead and try to finish up tonight. I think we will. He says, he talked about himself. He's talking about these legalists are coming in. They want to boast about getting people to get circumcised and go back under the law. He goes on to say, May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ 
through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He has been crucified, cru the world has been crucified to him and I to the world. What does that mean? What, what, what is that talking about? Somebody that has that happen in their life, that's what we call what? Born again. The old is gone, the new is here. It tells us this in Galatians 5.24. This speaks of this same thing. It says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Well, how does that crucifixion come about? It's about the born again experience. It's about the Holy Spirit coming to live in a person. But... We have to help do that in our life. That's when you got to be careful that you don't, I don't want to beat this to death, but you don't get stuck in that living in a continually unrepentant lifestyle. The Holy Spirit's going to come in and do the work, but we got to be on board and let the Holy Spirit do it. Amen? And then he goes on to say, in verse 15, he says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, if I could read, means anything. What counts is a new creation. No, we're born again. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or undercircumcised. Legal, Jew, non-Jew. What matters is you become a new creation. And that only happens in the new <coughs> covenant, the covenant of grace. I know I've said this multiple times, but somebody who's wanting to go to heaven under a legalistic system and is completely relying on tradition and things, there is no possibility for them to become a new creation. Because only under the covenant of grace and accepting Jesus Christ and born, being born again when the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you, do you become a new creation. The old covenant had no power to do that. You can't live under the old covenant if you're living in the new covenant. Right. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to they were trying to take the new covenant and the old covenant and merge it. And Paul's like, no, that you can't do that. You gotta you gotta live completely under one or the other. You want to live under the law, guess what? You gotta keep all the law. You want to earn your way to heaven, you've got to do it all the way. You can't say, well, I'll accept Christ and I'll follow some of these laws, but when I mess up, Christ, no. It's not the way it works. You either completely believe in Jesus and get to heaven through Jesus Christ and the promise of God, or you live under the law and try to earn your way to heaven. That's it's your choice. But before we get too hard on them, there is still religious circles Nowadays, they're trying to do that. We can call the old, the old testament, old testament, new testament, new testament. It's actually it's the old covenant and the new covenant. Yeah. So let's see, verse sixteen. It says, "Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God." Follow what rule? That they don't boast, except for in Jesus Christ. That you become a new creation in Christ. That you live according to the Spirit. Everything is talking about. Let the Spirit lead you. Doing good deeds motivated by God's love. And doing, fulfilling the law of Christ. And he says, even to the Israel of God. What is he talking about there, do you think, when he says the Israel of God? That's talking about real believers. That's talking about descendants of Abraham. Not according to the bloodline but according to the promise and faith. Mm. That's the real Israel. <clears throat> you know, if you if you want to study out like Revelation and some of the prophecy, Isaiah talks about some of it. There's gonna, in the end times, there's going to be a remnant of Jews that come to the saving faith of Jesus Christ and accept Him as Savior. The true Israel that he's talking about is all believers that trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. That's the true Israel. Then he goes on verse 17. Two more verses and we'll be done. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. 
Now, I thought about looking up a bunch of scripture and looking at all the things, but we could spend 30 minutes on that. But just understand, if you go through all the different epistles and different things, he was beat, he was stoned, he was whipped, he was shipwrecked, he was bitten by poisonous snakes. I mean, he got the tar beat out of him all the time for sharing the gospel message. So that's the marks of Jesus he's talking about. And then the last verse, it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. I love that. That's precious. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That's not talking about the Holy Spirit. Your spirit. The part that we fight against all the time. That's what he's talking about there. Well, that finishes up Galatians. Is there any comments or questions for tonight before I pray? Would you guys leave? Hopefully you enjoyed it. I thought this was a pretty cool study. Because, just really quick, I want to say this one more time. we got to be careful that we don't fall in legalism. Right. And that means when we sin and we blow it, we simply repent and turn to God. And understand that's enough. And He's faithful and just to forgive you because of the work of the cross. And it says He will cleanse you from unrighteousness. We don't try to earn anything. We don't try to make it up. We don't try to do any of that stuff. Because if we do any of that, we start doing what? Jesus plus something. Okay? And that's what legalists do. So before you just open say, oh, I never do it, think about it. Because we're all gonna we're all gonna sin again. It's gonna happen. And then are you gonna trust in the work of the cross and repent and turn into God? Or are you gonna try to do something to make it up? See, that's what we gotta guard against. <coughs> Go ahead and pray. If there's no comments, I'll go ahead and pray and let you leave. Okay. Father, we thank you for this time we have together, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for these precious words. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you'll just explode these truths into our hearts. And I thank you for that. And once again, Lord, I just pray for protection and leading and guiding for each individual person here. And once again, the prayer request, Lord, all the people that are struggling with these issues, we just pray that you'll bless them and touch them. And I thank you for that. In the name of above all names, I pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.